for, I'm pretty sure it's for this part. I don't know if you guys want to see what we're doing. All right, we're missing a few people, but I'm going to go ahead and no, uh, start like, talking you know, about works. ethics. Yeah, that was happening to me in uh, yeah, 112. Yeah. Who knows anything about media ethics? Ethics. Ethics. Why would ethics be a part of media? The photoshopping and your portrait sort of uh, issue makes them have to make themselves better than it's actually more human than possible. Yeah. Yeah, people get in trouble all the time for, for what they call shopping. There's Photoshop, and then there's shopping. And shopping is over Photoshopping. That's what, whenever you hear anybody say, I'm, oh, that, that photo is incredibly shopped, or whatever, that's what they're talking about. They're saying that this image can't possibly be real uh, or hold any kind of you know, ethical standard to it. Uh, so in any case, that's, that's just one of many, many, many facets to, to ethical journalism. The words ethical journalism apply. Open for, for the stragglers. The words ethical journalism apply to a whole broad range of things. They're from, from the, the text itself that people put into stories to the visual to the art, as, as it's called in, in the newsroom, anytime they say art, they're talking about anything that's not text. So advertising images, uh, pictures that go along with the stories or, or feature images, uh, cut lines, any of that stuff. Uh, so in any case, uh, we're going we're gonna to go a little bit of a topical discussion with that starting out today and cover some of those ideas. Has anybody looked at the resources today? Yeah, I don't know about all that. All right. Um, what I what I did was I went and found out uh, a few. I found a few things. Now, when we think about ethically questionable stuff as far as media production, as far as publications, newspapers, magazines, what is one, maybe two, maybe three publications that we absolutely know without a shadow of a doubt are always going to be solid reporting, solid photography, solid uh, fact checking and things like that? 100% of the time. 100% of the time, all the time, every time, yeah. Time. Time. I'll put that one on the table. What else? It's, it's on the page, National Geographic. Geographic. <laughs> what else? National Geographic. What else? You guys seriously can't think of one publication that's known for their word? It doesn't have well. No, it's a different category entirely. So, so it's, it's first of all nearly impossible to find one publication that 100% of their history is completely unencumbered by uh, factual taboos, as they, as they say, like uh, questionable things that they put on, the, on their covers or within their pages. Right? Even National Geographic had a big snafu once. Does anybody know what their big failure was? They failed big time once. Right on the cover. It's pretty famous. It's pretty... Of what? National Geographic had a cover that was ethically questionable. Very questionable. One year. Before anybody in this room, except me, of course, was born. <laughs> Why did I say it like that? Uh, nobody? And I think it was 1989. I think it was the June 1989 issue. National Geographic published a, uh, an, uh, an edition with the cover 
of the pictures of the pyramids of Giza. And the photographer or the managing editor at the time moved one of the pyramids in because the, you know, the there's landscape and there's portrait. And the magazine itself is not printed in a landscape format, right? It's printed in portrait. Well, if you take a picture of the pyramids of Egypt, of, of Giza, no matter where you are from that angle, you can't, unless you're in a helicopter or something, uh, it's very hard to put all those in one shot, right? So what they did was they moved one. That's the one. What year is it? No idea. You should say right on the cover. Then. 1980. Okay. There you go. Or 87. Okay. Yeah. In any case, it looks good. It looks real. It looks legitimate, but it's not. And that manager, that managing editor, 82, uh, 82 was fired <laughs> for that. They put new management in and made an outright, very public promise to never do that again. Never. And they, as far as anybody knows, hasn't done that since. There are photographers that are hired by organizations like Reuters, or the Agence France Presse, or, or uh, the Nippon Press, or the Associated Press in the Western world. And one of the key factors, obviously beyond the scope of their, their, their professionalism and their quality, is their ethical treatment of their images. If at any point in their, in their past, you know, beyond like an obviously artful exhibit or something like that, if they have created images that they have sold uh, in such a way that they were shopped beyond their uh, initial uh, realism or initial uh, non-fiction basis, they won't be hired. In fact, there's a photographer named Rodriguez, and I can't remember his first name. It might even be like Robert Rodriguez, I can't recall, uh, who recently told his, his publisher, longtime publisher, Reuters, that he burned one of his, his images a bit too much to hide like a pot or something that was next to a soldier hiding out in front of a bunker. And it wasn't even shocked in, in such a way that we're, we, we're gonna talk about today that's like overly dramatic and clearly false. He just got rid of an item yeah. and they let him go because of that. This one? Mm -hmm. Rodriguez? No, it's not Rodriguez. Look up, uh, just Google Reuters Rodriguez uh, Photoshop or something. Uh, so in any case, they, they, they let him go. This guy's been working for him for like 20 years. He's never turned in anything like that. And it was on him, right? He, he actually went to them and said, I, I did this, I'm sorry. They never would have caught it otherwise. Because it looks pretty nice. It looks just look. It looks like a shadow that kind of covers up this little area that he burned out. And uh, so, in any case, that the they let him go because it's 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 their name that's on the line, and it's that name that is is going to be the bulk of of what we're talking about. The underlying idea here is that you always protect your name. If if you put your name on something and then you sell it. It better be solid. It better be exactly what you say it is. It better be exactly what the client wants. And it better be ethically unchallengeable, right? Unquestionable in every way. And it's very easy to do that. Uh, you know, most people think, oh, well, how am I gonna get a compelling image if I, I'm not able to Photoshop it? That's not the case. You're, you are able to Photoshop it. It's just that you're, there are limitations to that. And we'll, we'll talk about what those limitations are, where the boundaries are, uh, there's, there's, there's opinion versus fact and all of these other things and there's a little bit of gray area so that's it's, it's an important one to know and we'll be doing that today ask me later as in like five hours from now huh? five minutes okay, continue on. all right so editing for nonfiction photography is very different animal uh, than editing for other applications in most cases this kind of work is called ethical editing just covered that because it focuses on the subject as the most important part of the image. The subject is, for all intents and purposes, the most important part of nonfiction photography. The angle, your creativity, things like that, you can still have those at play. I'll just, and that's I think what I talked about here. Artistic style and technique can still be implemented in nonfiction photography, but these aspects predominantly take place during the capturing of the image. 
rather than in, in the digital darkroom. So what that means is when you go out to capture your images, I, I want you to just shoot as if the last thing you can do is pull it right out of that frame. Pull it right out of the camera and it should be pretty close. Right, that's, that's, what a, what, that's what a good photographer does um, before post-production. Uh, production is the capturing of the image. Pre-production is any kind of uh, research that you do or set up. And then post-production is the editing. Pre-production and then post-production. So, organizations such as the Smithsonian Institute and the National Geographic Society have maintained their names in the world of visual, media st uh, visual storytelling by way of hard-lined imperatives in this area. While they showcase amazing images and well-written stories, they simply don't allow any form of embellishment in their published media. And when they do, when they mess up, they admit it, they don't hide it, they don't, they don't feed the scandal. They, they're, the National Geographic, how, how many people have seen the National Geographic in the news for scandal? Right? How many people have seen Star Gazette or, or like uh, the, the tabloid things in for scandal? Plenty, right? Plenty of people go in for like photoshopping, you know, Brad Pitt with the, the Queen or something on a balcony, right? I mean, like we've we've all heard about stuff like that because their ethics are completely, completely flimsy, right? They're 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 below standards because they're all about you know getting in dollars, right? That's all they care about. Um, Okay, so just like the facts of a story need to be fact-checked, the facets of each photograph need to be placed under the microscope as well. It is only through complete dedication to scrutiny that a media organization can hope to maintain its place at the top of ethically sound publications. And they work very hard at it. The bottom line for most of those publications is you hire good people, you don't even waste time with anybody who has any track record in their past of falsifying their stuff. Any hint of that, they got nothing to do with you, and they'll never talk to you again. All right? Immediately blacklisted. All right? It's like the military of magazines. You know what I mean? Uh, all right. So what I've done is I've copied and pasted the uh, the standards. I found that that Net Geo has right on one of their websites. They has anybody heard of Your Shot? Your Shot is a portion of the Nat Geo magazine, the online version of the Nat Geo magazine that allows you to post your own images. I've got a few of those myself on there. Uh, <clears throat> in their words, we allow and encourage all types of photography. We love to see new photography and watch our members experiment with creative styles and techniques. We are device agnostic. What does that mean? Don't care what you use. What's that? Don't care what you use for a camera. Pretty much. Yeah. Uh, happy to see images from full frame DSLRs, film cameras, smartphones, and others. Our biggest ask, which is strange to write it like that, is that the photos stay true to your personal vision and what you and what you saw. Please avoid heavy-handed processing. Heavy-handed processing. What is that? Shopping. Yeah. In a word. Photoshop. Uh, we want to see the world through your eyes, not through excessive editing tools. How many people find that a big relief? I got one. Yeah. Why? Why is why is that a good thing for us? You don't have to be good at photoshopping. You you can you can be a good photographer. You don't have to be a good programmer or visual media artist or anything like that. You can just go out and see an image. You can capture that image, and for all intents and purposes, that's exactly what they want. They want a good image, right? So, those of you who thought you were going to come in today and be like, oh my God, I can't do this. I'm not good at this software. You know, you don't have to know all the little tools. We're probably going to use maybe five, six tools in here. All right, we're going to talk about the good stuff, the levels, how to get a, a correct exposure from your images, how to, how to color balance the correct way not necessarily so that it's a gorgeous image, but that it reflects, most importantly, what you saw, right? As long as you get it close to what you saw, that's, that's the most correct your photo will ever be. Right? It doesn't have to be this dramatic landscape with all of these beautiful colors that you spend 
oh, you do the you do the eyedropper on this image, and then you crank up that into that color, and then you do the eyedropper on that shade, and you, you you change the tonality of that shade. Don't worry about all that. It needs to be close to what you saw, right? That's the key, and that's what they want. Ethics. The first paragraph, like this is right from the editor's desk right here. The first thing they mention is ethics, right? How many people think that's important then? They're, they're big ethics people. National Geographic supports ethical photography that accurately represents cultures, ecosystems, and wildlife. Very important words here. <clears throat> accurately represents the following, right? Accurately represents. Not artistically. They could have used the word artistic. It's not like they forgot that word in their vocabulary. They said accurately, right? Represents those, those aspects. Uh, we expect that the welfare of people, animals, and their environments take precedence over photography. What does that mean? The welfare of your subject takes precedence over the photography. If you're going out there to take a picture, why does why does that take precedence over your camera? So you can get something in its truest form? In its truest form? If, you're, if you've got two things here, you've got like, ooh, this would, this, you've got one good shot over here and the real shot right here. If I could just move this one thing in this one way, it would make such a better shot. What do they want? This one or this one? The real one. They want this one. They don't want you to go and mess with the environment. They don't want you to go and say, oh, uh, chief of the village, could I have you come over here and stab the pig one more time? They don't want that. They want you to catch it as it's happening the first time, right? So that requires you to be what? A good, uh, a good scene setter or a good photographer on his mission, right? That's what, that, that's what they're talking about there. They want you to protect the integrity of the scene at all costs. Just because you're there to get good shots doesn't mean you get to recreate the scene. In other words, don't harm or manipulate the subject or its environment for the sake of creating an image. Boom. Encapsulate it right there. I'll let you guys read the rest of those, and I do want you to read those because they're, they're good. But we can stop there and start talking about our, our images, okay? All right. So let's do exactly that. So I really liked this is James. Is that yours? When did you put that up? Just now? Yeah, it was a draft. I liked uh, I liked what I saw when everybody was together in the studio the other day. I haven't had any follow up because I wanted to kind of express my appreciation for how well that that worked the other day. Uh, everybody had a different idea, uh, but somehow we worked it right. Somehow we all got our stuff in. Um, everybody, did anybody have a problem with exposure? Anybody have any issues with, with, their, with their shots coming back? Those are pretty decent lights, right? They really do a good job of painting the whole scene with a good quality temperature. Great lights. I mean, look, you know, depending on who shot what and, and, and where and when and all that, thanks. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, so we got a little bit of overexposure here, but let's look at this overexposure. The most overexposed thing is here, and it's still got a great gradient, right? Maybe, maybe this is the side of this tablet here, but we still have detail. And I don't know if you can see that. You can't really see it on the projector, but uh, on your on your screens probably is even better. Uh, Following along there, we got great. We got those lights are. We did not do that. Thank you. Um, those lights are great. We got a good temperature setting on there, and everybody I think came away with very unique, uh, very good and, and interesting shots. You guys can give yourselves an attaboy and a pat on the back for that. Even the shadows work well, I think. Uh, Could have gone for. I could have gone for this angle in most of them. That was yours, Riley, right? Yeah. I could have gone for a lower angle in all of them, which I think you started capitalizing on here. <laughs> here, right? Because that's a little more interesting than that one. 
right? Mm -hmm. That is how you would normally look at it right there. And this is how, I don't know, a fellow bike would look at it, right? It's, something. it's like a bike that's in a photo shoot with another bike. Oh, give it to me, hurt me, please. I like this one. the story? What are they doing? Yeah, they're dueling or like something, right? I mean, they're definitely, they definitely have a relationship with some kind. It's, it's off balance. Also really gives it some nice tension. Yeah, right? It's an uncomfortable angle, a little bit. It's even though they're like playing a little cartoonish thingies. Yeah. It's an ominous shot. Mm -hmm. From that perspective. Yeah, there's there's more than just depth of field making this subject here more important. What else is important? What else is separating this besides this character being a focus? It's definitely a contrasting color. Yep, and there's another one. What was our whole workshop about? Yeah. Look at the lighting on this character, and look at the lighting on this character, right? We've got we've got this one lit from behind, and this one lit from from the front, right? Normally, what we'll have um, in in wedding photography, 
the uh, the groom is very has very little to do with the photography, right? The photographs that come out of a wedding, they're for the female, right? They're for the bride. They're but there has to be a guy in it, right? I mean, that, that's pretty much, it could be pretty much any dude standing there in a tuxedo. It's mostly for the bride. The bride is, is encapsulated in this flowy white thing, and it's all roses and pretty and all that stuff, right? Um, and so the thing that is also most focused on is uh, aspects of the light and the focus the depth of field, right? So the distance from the, the camera, the, the focal depth, the depth of field, and the light all create this portion of the image to be more important. All right? I mean, you guys can, yeah. I was just going to say, I have an idea for like expanding off of that. Yeah? Because um, the reflection in Batman's mask reminds me of like the moon. And I was thinking if that was the only light, then it would definitely look like a night scene and like it was about to battle something at night because that resembles a moon so closely. Yeah. Well, the thing that enforces that is, do you know what enforces that? Yeah. The background, right? Yeah. Because the background is not light. Mm -hmm. She had the uh, reflector, and I think she had it tilted forward to reflect the blue floor mm -hmm. on that one. Cool. All parts of that scene were very well played. Bravo, bravo. It's almost like there's there's a different scene there, right? And now the escape. He's defeated the the foe, and now it's time for that. Uh, oh, and he's smirking. <laughs> nice. So the first shot. Second battle ensues. The, the, the second character is even less important now because he's even more fuzzed out, more out of focus, and he's like blotched out by the light of, you know, good versus evil, right? Probably. And then, then Batman stands alone, victorious, by his trusty iron steed. Pretty awesome. <coughs> these were cool. I like the relationship on these three. Uh, the who is this? Katie? Yep. Where you got? Shot these from a not a standing position. That's actually why I like these. There's stuff in the background that I would like to take out, but ultimately the, the thing that I like the most is that we are shooting below, slightly below here, maybe neck to shoulder level, and shooting up into the face. This one is shooting straight on, pretty much. And then this one is just above the head, but still not standing, it's crouching a little bit, right? Because yeah. you're, you're pretty tall, right? You're like. Five eight maybe. Five six. I think. <laughs> so. Yeah. Great, great stuff here. If we could have separated that, uh, if we could have pulled that light back a little bit, taken the haze out of there, who shot these? We could have taken out that little smoky haze right there. That's actually a, a very uh, foggy lens flare, is what that is, actually. And it's because the light was too close, but. Decent lighting, right? A little bit of a shape to the face here, brought on by, by a faint shadow in the hair. One hard shadow in the entire shot, just this one. We could have gotten rid of that by doing, what? Having an assistant hold a reflector right underneath, right? Looking, looking into the space here. Very well crafted. Slightly candid. I don't like this. This is a distraction, but 
It plays well. For all intents and purposes, it kind of sticks into her head like a bit of a horror movie, but it's even got like, to, to, to nail it home, it's even got like a creepy old lady in the shot. Slightly somber. If we could uh, crop this off, that would have been good. Frame it in. But again, looking into that space there. All, all, all very well compositionally played. All right, good. So, and I'm gonna use these as examples to segue into our editing. What do you guys think is successful about this image? Everybody take a long look at it and think for a second about why this might, might be a successful image. There's a lot of things to talk about because there's a lot going on. So just start talking, pop out a little bit. Couple other kids. Say a couple ugly kids. A couple ugly kids. <laughs> <laughs> no argument there. <laughs> Where is he? <coughs> Where is he? Oh, he's back. Yeah. Mike. I thought I saw him walk in. He left. All right. What else? It tells the story, I guess. Like, you can kind of start to imagine what he would be saying. Just one of those questions. Check this chick out, man. <laughs> content, right? Even if they're faking, and they were faking, right? You know, that's the one thing I really like about still still images instead of video. You can tell somebody, dude, just laugh like you've never heard anything so much. Ready to go. And then they can just fake a laugh, and it comes out like this. Right? But what else? Right. It just looks really real, like it can be happening right now. Yep. Compositionally, does it follow the rules? Yeah. A little bit. There's a couple of implied lead lines. Now, we start with, we start here maybe, and then come up. Or well, we start on the face because it's light. This is the very lightest region over here. We might start here, kind of get drawn down. We're kept though, pretty much here, right? Does anybody have a different story about that? You kind of finalize on the phones, maybe? I don't know what you would call it, but it's good like interposition between their faces and then that other subject in the photo. Yeah. So you've got bam bam, bam bam. That was a good that was a good call. Catching things like that. There's a there's an image that I took in a market in Thailand where these two guys and I I sh not they're like the goofiest two dudes and they got these little sunglasses on and they're like kind of looking like ASC hey, what's up you know and right in front of them were these two door knockers that looked like their kids or something in demon form <laughs> and all i did was i crouched down and i made a portrait style shot out of it and it was them with their like otherworldly nemeses right <laughs> the thing that you the thing that that that, that we're talking about Colin's mentioning is that we've got two uh important uh items in the scene and then the next two that reflect those, kind of like a mirror. And that's a good relationship between those two subjects and those two subjects. Does it have a name? Does it have a name? Yeah. No. I mean, a relationship is just kind of a relationship. A con context, um, subject relationship would be probably an actor. What's another really good thing? That, that is accomplished with this shot. I'll say it, but I want to see if anybody else can figure it out. The softening of the lighting and how it eliminates their skin tone. Really. Yeah, the only hard shadow is really here and it's still faint. Yeah. It was well lit. 
You brought those lights in pretty tight too, didn't you, Jay? Yeah. Yeah. The closer, it's kind of counterintuitive, but the closer you bring the light in, the softer it is. There is a there is a contrast in color. There is, yeah. On the on your computer monitors, if you've got this instead of on the projector, the colors actually are a bit more brilliant than, than on the projector. So there is some good contrast in colors. But what I'm looking for and what we're going to be talking about in our in our first portion of editing is that she fills the frame. There's very little of this frame that's not got something happening in it, right? Does everybody see that? Does everybody see what I'm talking about when I say that? There's even this space here has a shadow on it that kind of still points you down. And that's one thing that I have noticed in some of you kind of like leaning into, but not necessarily deliberately shooting for in your shots, that I want to see more of. Because when you, when you are <clears throat> able to fill the entirety of your frame with nothing but important stuff, that nothing is wasted, not, not one pixel area, not one photo side of your shot is, is wasted space, that's when you know you're a successful image taker, right? Because you're looking through the lens. You're, not, you're no longer, uh, and you don't have to have a camera in front of you, which is what I'm saying. You know, you're, you're always looking through the lens, and you could say, that would be a good frame. This, I could frame this up very nicely. And when you can interact on a three-dimensional plane with whatever your subject happens to be, you must come back and come in and look down and look up and put every important part of that frame together. That, that's when you go out the, the successful run. And that, and that does a very good job of that. So what I want everybody to do is, if you can, log on to these, la on these computers. If you haven't already, turned them on. And we're going to talk about how to <clears throat> do some basic cropping, dodging and burning, balance out the exposure, and stuff like that. What do we use? We're going to use Photoshop. If you have Photoshop on your own laptop, that's fine. Yeah. What's that? Sorry. Uh, well, I'm going to be using mine. specific tools that might not be available or translate well. What do you use for like name and password? It should be it should be your Blackboard stuff. Blackboard. Main Street. Sarah's are I have no idea what to do about that. If you had that problem, I I don't know. Mine was already logged on. It was enough trauma just to get this room. Is it working? It's almost working. Who's having problems logging on? Two, three. Try another computer. If, if you tried a few times and you can't do it, I'll try another computer. Yeah, I'm not really sure what to say about that. Oh, okay, that one knocked out. All right, it, out. it might just be that they're thinking. Yeah, that's what it was. Well, no, they like. What you use on? My blackboard. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's uh, your first name, by last name, and then um, you have blackboard. And as a very, very last resort, if you just can't get it working and you've tried another computer, you can hop on with somebody else. But I want everybody to try and get their own. Yes. Okay, I have a question about uh, the files that I use because I didn't put them up online because I was going to support raw files. Yeah. I'm going to change them so I can get them. Okay. Well, you can actually change them right here. Do you have them with you? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can convert them right here. I'll show you how. Okay. All right, so if you have your uh, stuff with you, your card or your camera or both, I believe you've got one you've got the other. Uh, and even if you don't, if you've got something loaded onto the website, you can just save that image to uh, a folder on the desktop and work with it from there. Do you have sharp stuff in your hmm? yeah, Dude, just I just got stabbed in the mind. That's <laughs> terrible. <laughs> I hate that shit. Yeah, yeah, I know. I'll let you just sit down. 
Yeah, what if you could air drop? NBC has a, a, a phenomenal, all over the world, they, they pull in photos, mostly from uh, journalism organizations, and it's just incredible imagery. Anybody looking for inspiring content, week in <coughs> incredible. There's also like, uh, <coughs> Another one, uh, Reuters. <coughs> Reuters has a weekly selection from you know, just from Reuters photographers around the world. Great images. I can't use any of those as examples of what to do in here because they're all correctly balanced and <laughs> cropped and all that. So, uh, trying to uh, I'm trying to get an image that. How, does somebody have an image that they would like me to edit? Yeah. Do I email to me? Alright, that would be good. You want to pull them up or you want to start them Yeah, I don't have a card with me. 
Did you, uh, you have your any assignments up? Yeah. Uh, <coughs> download one you've already put up and put a bunch of photos. So. Can I just use any? Yeah, any photo you got that yeah. you want to work with? Just do it on your laptop. Did you have Photoshop? Yeah. Yeah. So should we pick? I've got to put my own website Anybody got anybody got a power cord they wouldn't mind? No, I have cords because I'll put it. Oh yeah, really? How many underneath DC? They are underneath. There's one way over there. Well, if you if you can plug it along with the email to yourself and pull it up on this one, will that work? Yeah, there's all this over here. The important thing is that we get going because I don't want to. We're already about halfway through. What's up? All right, so uh, is this the one you want to work with? Well, I mean, pick one. Do you want to do it? Uh, yeah. All right, when you, when you option click and open your image, it's going to probably, depending on the, the version of Photoshop you're working with, probably going to open it up in uh, Bridge. And that's a good thing. Are we still recording over here? No. Should we yeah. pick a kind of shittier photo? I, I really don't know how to tell you the answer to that one. Just um, without looking at it, you know what I mean? Um, just pick one that you want you you have wanted to edit for a while if you have that freedom if you have those images available to you. All right, yeah, that did not open. In, this is the one. Yeah. Did? No, I just did some previews. Just press oh, okay. spacebar. Yeah. So that one just. All right. Now the first thing that we're gonna do. Ooh, this can't First thing that we're going to do is look at the histogram. Every time you open up an image, the first thing you're going to do is look at the histogram. You're going to want to make sure that it's balanced. Riley, has a balanced image. You got yours open? Yeah, the food. I need to stop. You still waiting? Yeah. I need to get it onto this one. You have you got Photoshop on your laptop, right? Yeah. No. So you're waiting on getting it there or something? Mm -hmm. I gotta save my flash drive. I think he's done. Okay. Let's uh, pop yeah. that out and hand it back over to him. Um. Chris Bradley. Flying free. Like most of us have images, just keep working on it. Okay. All right. So the first thing we're going to look at is the histogram. Let's look at this one. We look up front. Do we think that's balanced? How do we know? 
there's a lot of different things that you can you can find out to tell if or a lot of things you can look at to tell if it's a balanced image it's not always going to be flat and perfect and pretty all the way across with all the colors like being perfectly you know uh, presumably balanced upon first investigation why it all depends on the content there might be a hot part of your image there might be a cold part of your image there might be uh, and it, it might be just based on what you shoot there might be no way to make that shot without having an overexposed portion of it depending on what you want to do for your content or for your focus your main subject basically in this shot he was able to uh, get uh, you can't really see this on on the on the projector but there, there is some decent detail down here and a correctly or mostly correctly exposed sky to 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 hit the balance between the two he he risked or sacrificed i should say a little bit of the detail in the clouds over exposing the clouds so that he could get this portion down here. Now a camera only has a few stops of latitude for, for its exposure. And unless you're using something like high dynamic range style photography, this is what you're gonna, this is the best you're gonna get for without using a filter and uh, you know going, going through the motions on, on a different sort of scale. But the main thing that I want you to be concerned with, with is gonna be looking at the top of your histogram. All right, that's the biggest key, finding out the, the overexposure item, the list of overexposed items or areas in your photo. If nothing that you have on that histogram touches the top, then nothing is overexposed. Now, conversely, this area here where there's, it goes all the way down to the, to the, to the, the deck here, basically drops all the way down, these are your darker areas over here to the left, and you've got some that do bottom out. Now, I don't mean to say that they're gone, I just mean they're bottomed out, which is why we have a line here. Over here, see that tiny little space that doesn't have anything bottomed out on it? That's where we don't have anything. That means that this uh, array of highlights technically doesn't exist in that shot. They don't. Uh, they don't lend themselves to the visible spectrum of light. They're not there, basically put. All right. So if he doesn't have uh, an area of this photograph that is too, too light, uh, which is you know a good thing. Uh, the first thing we want to do when we when we check our levels is actually I'm not going to do that in Bridge. I'll do I'll do the le levels in in Photoshop itself. I won't, I won't do that in Bridge. But opening it in Bridge is going to allow you to do some preliminary edits to prep you to do the big edits that you do later. All right, so in terms of journalistic ethics, applying, applying uh, ethics to your editing, the stuff on this page, the stuff on the front, whenever it opens up, these are your basic edits, as indicated right here by the word basic. Everything on this one is perfectly acceptable to mess with for ethical journalism, for ethical shots. You go beyond that, you've got tone curves. This is actually called what they call it, what they call it curves. Um, generally you want kind of like an S curve in, in when you're when you're done messing with it. Co again, completely acceptable to mess with this one as well. However, you start getting over here into the into you know the, the all of these the hues and saturation, that's gonna get a little funky. I don't want anybody in here to mess with and saturation I don't unless you're going to have your shot purposefully taken in black and white I don't want you to mess with saturation at all we'll talk about how to balance out colors in Photoshop itself all right now you can convert it to grayscale right here which is the easiest way to do it or you can hit I think it's command shift U once it's opened up in Photoshop and it'll do the same thing but um, all of your all of your grain, uh, various camera calibrations here. These are you can actually put uh, different filters on it and different different presets that you, you have saved previously. You go in here, all that stuff. But these these first two, these are the ones where you want to stick to for editing for for this class. All right, everybody understand that? 
Okay. Yeah. Which two do you stick to? Mm -hmm. Sorry, my image is like first. These two right here, these two items in bridge. Right? When, you're, when your image opens up in bridge, these are the two you want to be preserving. Don't worry about any of these other ones. All right? When you're done getting, the, getting this about where you want it, open it up in Photoshop. I'm not going to mess with it here. I'm going to just open it up and then open, in, open image down here at the bottom right is how you do that. Or you can just hit the enter button, I think. The enter key. All right. So, uh, how many of you are already familiar with Photoshop on a general, on a general basis? Raise your hand. So awesome. Most of you actually have this. Yeah. Okay. Oh, so nice. So you guys are going to know when I point out that these are all the tools over here. Yes. All the tools. That, not all, but. Uh, uh, no. Oh, uh, yeah. No. <coughs> These are your tools way over here. There are quick keys to get to them. For instance, V selects a vector. You just hit the V key and it will allow you to move your selection. Yeah, yeah. Uh, M for marquee. And if you just leave your mouse on there, it'll actually give you the quick key for it. Just hover your mouse over the tool that you want. L for lasso, uh, but I'll C for crop. Uh, you know, all the different tools here, they all have their own individual little letters. Everybody got that? Stone clamp, if you use that in this class, you'll fail. There's no clamp, there's no, there's no, uh, clump, what did I say? Stone clamp. Stone clamping, there's no stone clamping here. There's no clone stamping. I don't want you to take any part of your image and reproduce it for another part of the image. That's that's a big no-no. Big old no-no. Uh, gradient, uh, instead of telling you what not to do, I'll just tell you what to do. You're gonna use the crop tool, all right? The other, basically the other tool that we're gonna use in here is gonna be not necessar <coughs> necessarily found there. Everybody hit the L key. Okay, that's what I said. Uh, com uh, command L, I meant. That's what I meant. Command L. And that pulls up what? Yep. That's the first thing you want to do. So, everybody look at your histogram. And on the outsides, the far outsides of it, if you have some space there that is not, that it, that it kind of comes down to the outside and it touches the base. What I want you to do is bring whatever uh, scalar is near it and bring it in all the way to the edge of that. So what you're doing is you're removing from the image all of the stuff that doesn't exist. Does everybody understand that? So I brought it from here to here, right to where that information begins. So I've removed that tiny little uh, invisible space, so to speak. I've removed it on a digital level. I've gotten rid of it. And now we're only working with the visual palette. Does everybody understand that concept? It's kind of weird to understand it that you're actually removing invisible stuff. How do you remove something that doesn't exist? Well, digitally, now it really doesn't exist, right? So now, now that all of the edits that we're going to be doing are going to be on step that we can actually control instead of that invisible space. All right. Now, this uh, the so these three um, I can't what you call them scalers. We'll call them in this class. Are there three different colors? There's a dark one, uh, a gray one, and a, and a lighter colored one. And that is indicative of what they control. So this one controls the shading on the left, mid tones in the middle and highlights on the right. Everybody got that? I mean, you, oh. can't, you can't see it. I, I got oh. it. Yeah. But. <laughs> yeah. Sorry about that. Yeah. So dark, gray, and light. All right. So after you have selected your invisible area off of the histogram, then work on the mid-tones right here. 
I don't want you to just bring it up or down until you're satisfied visually that you have something nicely balanced for your, for your shot. And, and it may be in the positive and it may be in the negative because as you'll see, that the middle, the midpoint is, is 1.0. So you can bring it down to point, you know, whatever, or you can bring it up to one point something, right? For me, I think I'm gonna go right about here with this image. And based on what I'm seeing on the monitor, that that darker area is now revealed in a little bit greater detail. But what it doesn't do is overplay those lighter areas. That's what you want to be, that's the happy balance. The happy medium is that you've lightened the darkest parts, but you haven't overblown the lightest parts. All right, that's a very cool image. Is that a new one? I took it a while ago. Yeah, good, can we move that back over? Yeah, you can bring that. Did you bring that in like slightly? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I thought so, yeah. So if you're looking at, yeah. If you like it like that, then nail it in. You're going to lose a lot of dark and actually going to change the actual look of the histogram until you push enter or click save then if you open up levels again you'll notice that the histogram has changed because right now it's allowing you to work on the histogram as it is right now so let's go ahead and if you've got it where you want it go ahead and save or click OK and then hit control L again and you'll notice you've got a different looking histogram in there. Yep. All right. Thank you. 
center of the screen, hit the F keys. Ah, that's so much better. So when you hit the F key, it frees it up. Now you can hit the space bar and your little pointer will turn into a hand. So your, your space bar turns it, makes the hand, and you can move it around the, 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 the palette, the canvas, right? That'll make it a little easier for you to. There, there's another benefit to to and and purpose uh, the purpose behind the, the the color of the canvas itself is to make your eyes not pay attention to it. All right, you can turn that completely black by hitting the F key again for the third time, and you'll only see the image. Everybody, hit the F key again. And now you've got. This. Connor. 
it's more it's more than it's more important that you do it than you hear me say it. And you have to hear me say it in order to do it. But I want everybody to get used to the letters and the short keys and all that stuff. So just humor me and do it. All right, hit the F key again, and then we'll return to that first screen that you had. And you can do that over and over and over again. What I prefer is to hit it just the one time so you can move your image around. And you can still see your tools options over on the left. You can't see it on this, the screen up here, but you'll, you'll still have those on your screen. All right, you guys have some good images pulled up. I like that one. Is this a new one for you? Yeah. Um, I didn't shoot in RAW, so I've got to change the settings, so it wants a little bit of quality, but... Yeah. Cool. 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 Space well. I wish I was, uh, I wish I was ending with that one instead. <laughs> oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah, total bit loud. Okay. Um, so, now we're going to talk about how to crop, alright? You've got a little bit of levels practice, but uh, not, not very in-depth, just to, just, just to begin to work with the visible light on the, on the histogram, all right? Now let's talk about how to crop it. The, the image here, let's, let's all like just look at this one for a second and digest this one, all right? There, there's one main division in this photograph that's here almost right in the center. If we're following the rules of composition in here, how should I crop it then? Anybody? From the bottom up. From the bottom up? So like this way? Yeah. The interesting thing that happens on Photoshop uh, version 5 and 6 is it gives you that tic-tac-toe. So I, there's very little guesswork on what makes it correctly correctly composed. <coughs> Right? Does do we lose? Let's 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 no, that's the other what's up? I mean like probably just like is that is that a permanent crop? Oh is it okay. So is it is it lossy down to the pixel level? Well, I mean no 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 like has if you want like once you press enter, does that mean you can't like resize the crop? Okay, so if I hit the enter key and it and it crops it, it takes it off your working palette right now. Okay. So I can't get it back. And you can, hit, you can hit Apple D and, okay. and get it back. Or you can save this immediately as a different file yeah. and create a whole different image. Which is what I would recommend doing. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna save anything that I do want to All right? So now now let's look at it and say, all right, well, do we like that? Is that is that more pleasing to the eye? There's not a whole lot of subject matter in here, but we do have a very well exposed image. So there's something that we do have to work with. And it's pretty, right? It's got good colors. Uh, just imagine that you can actually make out a little bit more detail than we were able to see, because unfortunately we've lost some. But it really is actually quite a pleasing image. The colors are very easy on the eyes, very easy to look at that image on the computer. Looks like the XP screen. The XP desktop. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> From like eight years ago. Yeah. Right. So let's let's look at that, and then the original image. We could also do what? We can crop it this way too, right? From the down, from the top down, right? So now what? Now of course I've got <laughs> that time of day that I'm going to get messed with by this. Well, let's pretend we can see it. And uh, so, which is more effective, the crop from the from the bottom down, uh, bottom up, or the top down? That's so hard to say. Bottom. Uh, Everybody likes the other one. So the first crop. Why is that? Anybody, anybody know why we would like that one? Why why is that more of a visual visually pleasing image? Besides the fact that there's a giant sun strike across it? 
the eye likes light stuff. I mean, the, the human eye is engineered to look for the light stuff first. That's essentially that's essentially why this is a little bit more pleasing. I mean, there's there's, there's some psychology behind it, but basically, but that's kind of where we're going to look. I personally like this way a little bit because for me, there's the clouds are awesome and dramatic, and he was able to catch a lot of detail in them. But I love what I'm seeing in the, in the, in the grass here. It's a very rich green that you just can't see up here on the projector that I like more than that light blue. And I even like light blue. If this, this shot actually, he's got a tiny little weed that stands right here. And the more you digest that image, the more you land right here on that weed. You must have been center planted right here because it's a pretty flat horizon. Yeah. What's it, what's it say? Does it, does it say the exit? It's a curve. Yeah. And uh, yeah, it's a curve. Yeah. 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 very symmetrical item anyway it's it's kind of it's not it's not technically composed but it's uh, aesthetically composed this, this center point and I, I personally I don't know that reminds me of like Montana or something if it had a little a mountain or something in the background or whatever it just reminds me of like the plains of Nebraska or you know something like that All right, however you want to crop it and fill that of you, but uh, something that has some stuff in the frame, like this shot here. Tristan's image is actually quite good. If you guys haven't seen what he came out with, everybody, uh, everybody has the uh, the tic tac toe lines on their image right now. Yes. Play with it. Move it around. Move it up, down, in, and out, and see if. What you have, you know, put put the confluence of those those cross sections on different things in your shot. The more you do that, the more your eyes get practice of saying, of, you know, you're teaching your eyes how to place things around that image. Now Mal has figured out that another thing you can do with the crop tool is. If you uh, if you crop all the way down, if this is what your crop looks like right here, you can also let's just bring it in like this, and then you can move your image around like that. So if, if what you want is to set the parameters of your crop, like if I want a uh, 1280 by 720. All right, if I want to fit it to the cover of a video that I'm doing, for instance, right? If that's the purpose of this shot, and I know that my, my video is an HD 720 or 1080, whatever you want to set for like 1920 by 1080, I can, I can set that information here. And generally, I would also have the option for uh, pixels per inch or dots per inch or DPI. For the web, DPI is fine. But for print and high resolution stuff, you're going to want to probably get a range of about 300 dpi resolution. Does everybody know what that means? Who does not know what dpi is? Okay, I'll, I'll table that for another time. That's a whole other discussion, so I'll, I'll table that. But uh, know that you can, you can move your image around if what you want is to say, oh, well, let's see what this looks like with most of the shot in the grass. 
without actually cropping it, or maybe what this looks like with most of the sky in the so shot. Does this crop allow for rotation? It does, yeah. Cool. You do all kinds of neat stuff with it. You cut it right in half, right down the center. There's that straightened tool up in the top left that we can use. Do a white fries in there. Just like drag it on a line with straight tool. I think it would be close to that. Right? right in the center still. And having having a shot that's right like this, that's completely symmetrical in every way, I'm not saying that's a bad image. But what I am saying is that I don't want it in here. All right? And once you learn how, when we learn the rules, then we can responsibly break them. And that's a great shot. That's, that's, very, that's very pleasing to the eye. But I just want us to stick to the rules, right? On your final project, project three, break them. Break them at your whim, because by then we better all have known how to how to correctly, uh, correctly and successfully navigate it the right ways. Correct? Yes. Mm -hmm. I got that. All right. So now, what are we going to look for when we crop? What was the success that was uh, that Jane lent to the image that we were talking about before? Proper placements of the subjects. Stuff, yeah. You want to do one thing in specific, and that's called fill the frame. Yeah? I don't want any wasted space. When you've got, a, when you've got someone looking into the frame like this, it's a good thing. It's a good thing when there's nothing there, but the nothing is being used in that shot, right? I think it was Shannon's shot where, where her subject was looking to the right and we had all of that frame. That frame, just because it was empty, it was still being used, right? That's the important part. But you don't want to overuse it, right? Let's just say, and we, we can just try and imagine uh, this happening here. Let's just say that there's a little kid standing right here playing with a ball. Little kid, like, like little, like this big. All right. If I had that child right here and had all this space around him, and maybe I cropped it up a little bit to have, let's say Junior is right here. Yeah? He's right where my pointer is. And he's, his, little, his role in this shot is to look small. If I have all of this space, is that going to work? I know it's kind of hard to make that assessment without that actually being in the shot, but let's just pretend for a little bit. Is that going to work or not? It depends. I, I shot it from an angle looking up, so it might look kind of big, but I mean, the addition of extra space is definitely going to make it look pretty small. If, if, if the point is to make it look small, then yes. Yeah. Right? Then that would work. However, Let's say for some strange reason we forgot all of the rules and we put him right about, say here, right? And he's kind of, he's kind of like, he takes up a good chunk of space in here. Now what do we have to do to make him look like a kid instead of like some overgrown <coughs> three-year-old? Pull back. We just have to, we'd have to put him there, right? Where he's, he's now here, and occupying this space here and there's still enough space to make him look a little bit small. Maybe have him looking into it or whatever, all right? Some, sometimes you just can't work with it. If he was standing here and he's looking the other direction, and then you try to crop all that other space into it, like over here, that's just, you know, sometimes it just won't work, right? But aesthetically, we're gonna follow the rules and say, all right, you get, a, you get about 20 or 30 or maybe 40 <coughs> of these images uh, under your belt, 
right? As far as editing, then you'll start to realize why that space needs to be filled and how much of it is, it's a balance, right? It's a balance, right? All right, so. <laughs> you said to build the image. Happy little sick man. <laughs> Stop playing with your boot. <laughs> All right, so do we have uh, do we have something cropped and and we have light balance in, in our shots? Where is that from? You might want to come play in on it. Let's, uh, if you want to save your image, go ahead and save your image. Well, let's, uh, let's open up another one now. I'm walking around the room and I see basically the, the, you know, duck face confusion and drunk. In some of your shots, you might have some confusing stuff in the background. It doesn't really play into the, the scene. If it does play in, fine. But if it doesn't, find the balance of cropping that out. If you have head space above your subjects, if there's too much head space, and they're too free to roam, so to speak, crop it down. Oh. How much head space is too much head space? It all kind of just depends on the shot. Yeah, I mean, if there's always that little cheat of of when you is that I mean you can you can turn off the tic tac toe, the guidelines is what they're called, or the or the grid it's also called. You can turn that off from your crop, but we should always kind of leave that on in here until we get the hang of it. Uh, being able to being able to fill your frame. Uh, or being able to know how much head space is appropriate or how much uh, lead space into the image that's, that your subject is looking into, for instance, that's going to be immediately available to you based on uh, where, where, those, where that grid lies. Put your thoughts to it. All right. So. What would you do to what would you do to bring her into about curves. All right. I forget what the I forget what the command prompt is to get curves. Does anybody know the command prompt to get curves? M. M. That's right. You hit uh, Apple M or can command M. All right. So this is your curves. Let me make sure that it's This is your curves uh, window. 
All right. Does anybody know about curves? Who does not? Raise your hand if you don't know about curves. You know again? All right. Curves is basically like levels, only you're able to you, you're able to see a real-time input of the it's, it's kind of like a balancing tool basically for your for your light spectrum. Now what you're gonna want to do is you'll actually grab <coughs> it's really dry in this room. Uh, you're gonna want to grab the line itself, click on it, and then move it in one direction or another. And what that's gonna do based on where you grab the line, it's going to automatically, so it's got an algorithm that attempts as best as possible to balance for you while you're moving that line and making it bow in, in one direction or another. Now, what I've done is, so just, just like your regular histogram, darks are over here to the left, lights are over here to the right. So if you grab the line over here to the right and you move it up or down, it's going to darken or lighten the highlights only. Now, I like that um, for the purposes of seeing it on the, on the, really, the, really that, the projector doesn't do it justice. But, kind of like yeah. So the other way you can grab it is down here and control the, the shadows. So generally speaking, you want an S curve and that's, and I say generally because that's not a rule. It's more just sort of like a guideline or a suggestion that if you bring it up this way on the top, you, you want to bring it down on the bottom. And that will create that S curve that I was talking about that, that I mentioned, all right? Everybody look up here for a second. All right, if you, if you bring it up on the highs, you want to bring it down on the lows, and that's what will create that S curve like that. All right, so I'll bring it down, and it might not work for this shot. I don't know, we'll see. On this shot, it does not work, all right? So this is a good example of why that is a general guideline, because it just killed everything down here. Yeah, you can't, it, it's, complete, it's a complete loss of data basically down here, right? So in this case, we will not want to have that S curve, but we can bounce it up like that, brings it up, and it, it, it very, very little affects the highlights. So it doesn't really touch my clouds at all. I can keep that detail and the, folk and, the and the sharpness, the contrast in those clouds, but it'll bring up all this stuff down here, where once I couldn't see it at all, now it's, it's actually quite decent, even on the projector, right? All right? So just play around with that. <coughs> so dry. Go ahead and play with that on your shot. <coughs> See what you can come up with? You've got a good shot to, to mess with her, by the way. She's got a lot of um, option for contrast there. And once you get that done, I'm gonna leave this like this. Go ahead and save it. And to get to your contrast, that's the, that's the other thing we're gonna deal with. Brightness and contrast is also a, a good, good balance to have in your images. So contrast, you go to image, up at the top bar, and when, that, and when the sub menu drops down, go to adjustments, and brightness and contrast is right there. It does not have a short key, a quick key to get to it. You just have to go through this stupid motion every time to open up. And it's been like this since like Photoshop 3. There's a faster way to do it. Oh. Go to window, yeah. and go to adjustments and click that. It should be, it's, yeah, it's gonna be right over there in that little box that has like 12 little tiny squares. Oh, and you know, bring it over so what you see yeah, it's already over there. Right. And one of those little buttons over there is the uh, first one, the one that's like a sun that's half black, half white, on the right side of the screen. Uh, yeah, it's already on. Oh, see, so click that again. And I go to the right side of the screen. Aha! Uh -huh. Shazam! Right They're all right there. They've improved it. So nice. All right, so let's see, here's curves. That's what we're... What? Uh -huh. It still doesn't have it. What? Oh, it's the first one. That's 
very graceful. All right. So when you, uh, oh, we can go to two. So nice. So nice. All right. So what is contrast? Before, before I start talking about it, what is contrast? What is the idea of contrast? Forget about photography. What does contrast mean in any other domain? What's the opposite of the word contrast? When you're writing an, when you're writing an essay, your professor wants you to compare. Compare and contrast the relationship of the 19, you know, 21, you know, end of the Industrial Revolution with the Renaissance era or something. I don't know. Con compare and contrast, happened. right? Let, what, what they're trying to do is to get you to see what's the same about, about one particular item and what's different about it, okay? <laughs> so contrast is, uh, I think as Trevor said, uh, the different parts, okay? Uh, the opposites of the <coughs> So when you're, when you're adjusting the contrast, you're separating as much as possible the highs from the lows, right? The highs from the lows. So you're getting a bit more separation. What is that gonna translate to as far as the image goes? Well, that all depends on what the image is. If I jack the contrast way up here on this image, it might, be, it might do the complete opposite that we do on Tristan's image or Julie's image, or whoever has a different, because I've got a lot of highs and a lot of lows right here. So it's actually going to be quite a dramatic change on this image. So let's see what it does. Again, all this is, all this is going to do is, is going to tailor it to your particular interest. So if you don't like it, don't use it, right? All right, so if I drag the brightness down on my screen, I can see a lot more detail in those clouds. Everybody see that? And right about here is my happy range. If I go lower than that, I just lose the clouds, right? The clouds are gone. Right about here, though, in fact, if it's in the middle, I've, I've got the little bit blown out. So what I'm going to do is concentrate my, my where I'm going to leave it, right about here. And what do I mean by concentrate? I mean pay attention to this number right here. It's going to be a positive or negative. In the very center, it's going to be zero, right? This is the negative portion, and this is the positive. Portion. It should go up to 100 or whatever preset you you had. If, it, if, it, if it's on a default, then it'll just be a default, right? So it goes down to 150 on this way, and positive 150 this way, right? All right, so I wanted about 66 on there the last time, something like that. Somewhere in there is a very decent range for me. And then, and then the, okay, <laughs> that was the brightness, damn it. All right, so the contrast is going to actually work a bit differently. Uh, the contrast based on the brightness is gonna focus on the grass in this one. So if I turn it up and then contrast it and then jack the contrast left and right, it's going to just basically bring out color. You see how that turned super uber green, like fantasy green? Wow. It really brought it out quite a bit. But then the clouds are completely gone. Yeah. In fact, you can even pick up dust on his sensor. Oh. You see that? There's a little spot here. You can clean your junk, man. It's on my junk. Right? So. Yeah, there's no telling how long this been. So, all right. So, but in any case, I'll bring it down. So, I, so I'm working on the clouds a little bit here, and then I'll and then I'll start messing with that. So, I can bring up the detail of the clouds if I go to the right in the positive sector of the contrast, or I can bring out the detail in the grass if I go into the negative sector. So, I just want to have. It's all about finding the happy medium, the balance. You're really not going to kill the image unless you go to the extreme right and left of these things. So use that tool on yours. Find the happy balance. Adjust the brightness and the contrast. In Congress, all right, these two need to be 
work together. Bring the brightness up and then find the contrast. And what, what parts of the image go up and down? Then bring the brightness down and do the contrast bar again. And just find out, find out what works and what doesn't. You got a lot of high highlights in this one. So that will draw your attention here then for the color of the flowers. How do you get that across the screen? I just click this. So now it's not dark. I mean it is a little bit more dark, but not the dark. I think you said that uh window and then adjust for this. Set that as it is. Sweet what that looks like. Oh, for the fans. 
about dodging and burning. Who knows what dodging and burning is? A few of you? All right. Dodging and burning is something that Photoshop has kept from the old school of photography. Dodging and burning is, is quite literally uh, when you were developing an image in the past, you would cover uh, an area that you wanted to dodge the light from, or you would cover around the area that you wanted to you know, dodge the rest of it, in which case you're burning a specific part of the area. And you literally cover the light with your hands or with another sheet. You even have a little tool that's like an eye cover that you, you bring it around and you dodge certain areas of it. And you do this for a period of time. And during, during, during that time, part of the image comes out and part of it doesn't. And by come out, I mean, I'm not talking about, uh, you know, Linda Ronstadt or anything I'm talking about. Uh, the actual more applicable image. No, we can use this one. All right. All right. <clears throat> so your dodge and burn tool is right over here. This is that little eye patch cover that I was talking about. And you can just hit the letter O. Or if you want to switch between them, you can hit Shift O. So get your you can just hit the letter O, you'll get your dodge tool, and it's just a little circle. To increase the size of that circle, you're going to hit the brackets button. Everybody know where the brackets button is? On your keyboard, it's right above the enter key and left of the slash key. Everybody got that? Those are your two brackets. And you hit those, and it'll increase the size of your little circle that you can't see on the screen. All right, so if I hit that bigger, if I hold it down, it just gets huge. Real quick, or I can do that one, right? That brings it down. Now, if you hit the shift key and hit your bracket buttons up and down, then it makes the outside of the circle fuzzy or solid. It has a stop of about four. You hit it four times. Uh, if you go shift and the, the right bracket, it's going to give you a very, very solid outer line of dodging. If you hit the shift key in the left bracket, it will give you uh, four times, it will give you the most fuzzy it can be. All right? So if you hit it two times, then it's going to give you somewhere in between. All right? All depends on what you want to do with it. Now, up here, you have, at the top of your screen, you have the word exposure. And it should be preset or defaulted to 50%. You can increase that or decrease that, whatever you want to do, but I'm going to leave mine at 50%. All that does is, is tell you how much, tell, tells the computer how much light to dodge or burn. That's all it does. All right, and this is what it will do. So if I've got it to, right now, <clears throat> right now it's on dodge. If you hold your, if you click and hold down, you can actually see what they are. There's the dodge at the top, the burn is in the middle, and if that thing wasn't in the way, it would show this, the hand making the circle, right? We look through, and then there's the sponge, and we won't worry about what the sponge tool does. So right now, we're gonna go with dodge, and dodge will make it what? What 
will the Dodge do? Anybody see what's happening? Everybody see that? Wait, is this the brand of Dodge? This one's the Dodge. All right? It's kind of counterintuitive. This would happen if what I did in the old school development phase of this. If I took a piece of paper and cut a hole in it, and, and, and this is why I kind of moved it around like this as the light was hitting the developer, hitting the, the actual paper in the development phase. Right? That's what would happen. I would dodge the rest of it and just hit that. Now, the burn tool does the opposite. It, does, it, it, it kind of closes in on it. Uh, it takes that, it takes that light out of it. So, to so go back in your history and get rid of the dodge, I'm gonna go right here. Now, I'm gonna hit my, I'm gonna hit Shift O, which then switches it to dodge, and it will darken it up. So I'm gonna make that big. Now, it doesn't necessarily work the same way. All right, so be, be mindful that what you're going to want to do with the dodge tool, you probably won't want to do with the, with the burn tool. And what I can do with the, with the dodge tool is what I'm doing now. I'm not going to do this down here in all the shadows, but I want to get some, sh some shading or a little more detail in these clouds. Everybody see what's happening when I do this? Okay. And it can add color back into, this, into the sky. Now, you don't want to overdo it because then you'll get like a storm cloud oh, strangeness over there or something. All right, but you can always go back a couple of steps, whatever you get. All right, but if you think that you want a little more detail in there, you can dodge those clouds a little bit. And really, me doing that, it doesn't look terribly unnatural, does it? All it did was bring a little bit of detail back from when it was too bright. All right? So, the tool I'm on right now is burn. All right? So what? So what do you use for the darks, the shadows? Dodge. Dodge to bring it up. And what do you do for the highlights? Burn. To bring it down. All right. Try that on some of the high, high con uh, contrasty and super highlighted areas of your shot. And I'm hoping that you pick up on some of this. Because you can really do a lot with that. Get a, get a bigger tool. Uh, you just click and hold down. Uh, you probably can. And for you, Jane, this is the tool I was talking about. Yeah, for that other one. Yeah. Yeah. This will be able to, if you if you if you expose that dark area, right. and you burn the top and bring that back out, and it's a lot easier than setting layers. Right? Yeah. Oh, you've already yeah, you've already done that, right? Yeah. So hit hit no button. You're on burn, so yeah, that'll do. So if you want to get the, the bigger tool, you can just use the racket. So get a bigger tool and see if you can swipe across that sky if you try. Big swipes. Alright? So now you're not affecting that area at all. And it's, and it's looking like it's better exposed. See, it looks better already. And all you did was dodge and burn. Now this is completely and perfectly acceptable. In fact, in most cases, for journalistic purposes, it is expected that you have correctly and not overly <laughs> dodged and burned your images prior to turning them in. If, if I am, a, am your managing editor and you give me an image and it's not, and if I see a part that's completely blown out and I don't like it, I'm like, why is this here? Why didn't you burn your images for me? This is blown out. It's way too bright. We've got to burn that down. You know, you got you got to dodge and burn. If I send it back two or three times, guess what? I'm not going to do the next time. Send you out into the field to get those shots, right? It's going to be expected. This is a very important tool to have in the repertoire. You need to step back emotionally from your picture and, and pretend that somebody else took that image. One of the best things you can do is emotionally detach from your image. When you take your image, when you, you, you spent all day researching, oh, I'm gonna go out to the lake, I'm gonna get this one shot of this one thing, and it's gonna look super awesome, and da 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 
forget all that when you're when you're in the editing phase because you're going to want to be like no I don't want to crop it down because I'm going to lose that one thing crop it down anyway because it needs to fill the space or dodge that stuff down because you need to darken those those highs or or burn it up because you need to bring those darks up a little bit don't get so attached to your image that it's an emotional battle look at that perfect look at that That's awesome. brought that sky right in don't get so attached to your image that you're fighting with your editor about, about the images that are going out, all right? Just a second ago, I was over with uh, Connor, we were talking about um, uh, cropping in on the, uh, the hands that he's working on right now. When he started out, there was, there was some good framing, framing within a frame, and that it would have been kind of effective, but as soon as we cropped in on the most important parts of that image, it's like, whoa, I've got a whole other image sitting here that I can work with now. And it's, it's all about just separating yourself from the, you know, attachment to that image. And dodging and burning. It's, it, I can teach to you in what, I think the whole discussion was five minutes. And now that you know how to do it, just play with it. And you'll, you'll, you'll find your own style with it. You'll find your own technique. Make sure you, you, you use the bigger and the smaller tool based on how much size. If you're, if you're going to dodge or burn a skyline, you're going to want a big tool. Raise your tool in diameter so that you don't, it doesn't look like you've got little bitty stripes across the sky. You don't want that, right? You want it to look natural. Dodge a big area. I'm sorry, burn a big area in the sky or dodge a big area in that broad under undergrowth or underbrush or whatever is causing those shadows, all right? Any questions about today? Did we have a pretty good workshop? Yes. Yeah. All right. Uh, I think I covered all the stuff that I wanted to cover. That we're going to get some more stuff. I'm really trying to secure the lab again for next Wednesday so that you guys can have your own time in it. But if I don't, if I can't do it, I can't do it. I don't know. I don't know what's going on. We we got like a perfect editing workshop right next door that we can't even use for some reason because. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to try to get us something, but if I can't, I'm just going to have, I'm just going to ask for some patience from you. We will fill our time appropriately, whatever that means at the time. So as of right now, there's no assignment other than to play with your software. If you have access to the software, so I'll grab you right after class. All right, you got a question. Um, and what else? Yeah, if you have if you have Photoshop, I want you to do the the cropping and the dodging and burning and your levels and your curves. I want you to do as much of that as possible. And again, no assignment, but we'll I'll start applying some stuff from here on out. And uh, shoot with media ethics in mind. All right, all right. I'll uh, I'll send out a bulletin. Let you guys know where class is next time. See you Wednesday. All right, what's up? Maybe uh, one. Uh, 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 I would probably uh, 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 I mean, uh, 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 yeah.
what I would do is set this to 12. Okay. Yep, maximum quality is usually 12. For some strange reason, I didn't put it like 10 or 100 or something. Okay. And then uh, you want to get that image off of here, so email that to yourself, yeah. probably. All right. I have questions about converting files. Slash how? Okay, so oh, right. yep. when I shot these and put them in raw, how am I going to put them up on the website? Because they're right. too big. Yeah, no, that's yeah, that's going to be. It. All right, so if you uh, is these you five? You didn't have Photoshop, did you? No. Oh, no. All right, do you have Bridge or do you have any kind of? Uh, edit, 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 image Auto editing Autodesk sketchbook, I don't know if that's yeah. gonna uh, It's going to take something probably pretty dedicated for raw images, so I would suggest opening up the, the ones that you want to save right now on the on the computer, mm -hmm. and then just open them right into uh, Photoshop, which they'll open into Bridge, mm -hmm. and you can do a batch convert. So just pick your images right now, and I'll, I'll walk you through it in a second when you got them up. Mm -hmm. Question? I don't really know if it's a question, but like, I my computer's broken, so I just sent it in to get uh, fixed. <laughs> yeah, is it so a Mac or? You no, know, it's a PC. Yeah. So, uh, I might not have a way to make my RAW into uh, convert them over, mm, but I could. You, how many of them are you trying to do? Not many. I, I'm just like. Like a handle? 20? Yeah. 30? I don't know. Uh, if you want, tomorrow from 10 to 12, you can stop by. Right. I'll be in room 109. Yeah. And I'll, do it, I'll do it for you. I was just going to tell you, I was going to start probably shooting in RAW plus JPEG just so I get both. And then yeah. I'll probably yeah. try and use my friend's computer when I can. Oh, okay. Because yeah, if you've got constant access to something that will convert your images, then yeah, then RAW, is, there's nothing wrong with that. All right. Uh, that reminds me, actually. Thanks for saying it, because I have to, I have to convert all my D800 images, which are like, I need a whole different converter <laughs> for the D800.